yeah, I guess we can get started. So I'll, uh, I'm going to start recording here. Hey, Kim. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, um, thanks. If you are watching this in the future, uh, this is probably going to go up hopefully on the Bristol YouTube channel. Uh, welcome. This is part of our fall one book series of uh, discussing pieces from Tales of Two Americas, which is our one book for this year about uh, stories of inequality in a divided nation. So we're trying to highlight over the year just different pieces from the book um, that touch on just a whole host of issues. And um, uh, Engen here, one of our faculty members just actually pointed out that this, um, this piece actually dovetails quite well with the fact that it is uh, Latinx Heritage Month. And uh, the piece that we're looking at today um, revolves around uh, uh, a Latino male who is, you know, uh, killed in an encounter with the police. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's a small group of us here, but let's just talk about this piece and what we thought about it. Um, so the piece is Death by Gentrification. It's actually the very first piece in the book. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly longish piece. And actually it's, um, interestingly, it was not, uh, so in the, so for the anthology, there's some pieces that are, that were, published for the anthology specifically or, or written um, for it. This piece was actually previously published um, from what I understand. It first appeared in The Guardian in, uh, I actually have it up here, let's see. Um, so it first appeared in The Guardian um, in 2016, um, but obviously um, John Freeman, the off the uh, editor of Tales of Two Americas, you know, felt that it was uh, such a compelling piece that, um, you know, I'm sure asked, asked for it to be, if it could be included in this um, uh, anthology. And um, I guess my initial thought, I was just rereading it again before, um, right before this today, is um, especially now, I mean, you know, this piece is already, like what, five years old? Um, uh, considering, you know, unfortunately, how many of these kinds of incidents, incidences we've had since then, um, this piece, in one way, this piece could read like just another sad story of uh, a minority person, um, getting unjustly killed by police, right? And uh, dying in a violent encounter with police. Um, in the sense that like we have, um, obviously, you know, we've had stories like that before this piece emerged. You know, I mean, Trayvon Martin, you know, Trayvon Martin's death occurred in 2014, I believe, right? Um, and I'm trying to remember when Michael Brown's death occurred. I mean, I feel like that was even, you know, um, that was previous to 2016 as well, I believe. So, I mean, obviously we've had some of these happen, but we they've just continued to happen, right? Um, so it's, in one way, it's like easy to like see a story like this and just almost sort of numb out because the details just feel like it's just like repeating the same details over and over of. But I thought the, um, the interesting thing that Solna does with this piece is the way that she couches it in this kind of larger phenomenon um, that she sees happening in, so, you know, it's about San Francisco, right? So this happened in San Francisco, but, um, but she couches the whole, you know, this, um, this killing of this young man, um, Alex Nieto by the San Francisco police it's not just about that, but she couches it in this larger story of the gentrification of San Francisco. And of course, the title of the piece is Death by Gentrification. Um, so I guess uh, I'd be curious, you know, what you guys, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, yeah, like reading this piece, you know, and, and just, you know, the violent encounter, the police encounter, the fact that we've read so many of these and you could kind of just almost check out, but then um, I don't know what, what your reaction was maybe to like how Solnit 
kind of sets up the story with this larger context. I'd be curious to see what what your reactions were. Um, yeah, to just the both the familiarity of like what happens in the story, but then how she does the unique thing she does in the way she sets it up in the larger situation. Hi, it's Engin here. Um, I thought the the uniqueness of the story was the the author's ability to map out the geographies of violence, along with um, how they intertwine with identity, misconceptions, these stereotypical myths, yeah. and and the general culture of consumption and 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 uh individualism you know this rugged individualism that we find especially in in a state like california which is a rat race uh, i can see that play out you know if you've ever visited california you can see how spatially it is a violent space hmm. uh, how people are carved out into different geographies based on their race and identity and I think the author was really, really good at blending all of that in and, and putting that out there as a structural constraint in, in achieving some sort of a democratic engagement in, in community. Because it, you know, it's not just about identity, right? It's not just about misconceptions. It's not just about historical stereotypes. It's about space and it's about everything that you find in, in the culture. It's not just one particular element that plays a role in why Nieto was killed. It's it's a combination of all. Mm -hmm. So she takes she takes into account everything, right? From mm -hmm. space geography to identity, all the way to like personal perspectives. So I thought that was really powerful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Kim, Beth, any thoughts as well on, on that? Um, well I had um uh, a funny reaction. Um, I mean, all the things that you've talked about so far, but um, my daughter until quite recently, one of my daughters lived in the mission uh, as a, a Google employee um, and took a shuttle, you know, to Mountain View to, uh, huh. you know, out of the mission. And so I felt a little bit almost like, um, like self-conscious reading it or, defensive sort of like oh but you know it's not her fault you know uh and and I, it prompted me to think about um how much we're feeling um in our cities and in our you know spaces in general at um um dealing with housing and, and I think it just creates um you know these like camps of people sort of um like it it's it's and I see this in Boston too a city that I'm more familiar with although I did become kind of familiar with um San Francisco when when she was living there but the fact that there's so much competition for such a small space um causes a lot of strife and um and I just don't think uh, cities are dealing with that realistically at all um mm -hmm. and just just to, you know, not that this is about my daughter at all, but she never, in the mission, she could only afford um, to rent an apartment with four other roommates. That's how expensive right. it was. So it wasn't like, oh, she works at Google, she can get her own apartment in the mission. It, it wasn't like that at all. Um, she was, you know, in one little room with a shared kitchen. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know what is going to be happening in our country in terms of this housing. I helped somebody find an apartment in Fall River recently, and it was hard for them to find anything that was under a thousand dollars a month in Fall River. Mm. In Fall River, yeah, right. You know. <laughs> so anyway, so that that really hit me. That like, of course, it's going to become an angry thing, the gentrification, because uh, you know we're competing for resources. I think anytime you're competing for resources. Um, 
there are people who get angry that it's fear for some and not fear for others. So anyway, that was one of my big reactions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with Beth about the housing element of the, of the essay. I think that's a super relevant takeaway that's only gotten worse in the years since the essay has come out. Um, and I mean, the essay really deals with like gentrification and police violence. Mm -hmm. Like these, these are the two main issues and then how really how the gentrification sort of um, impacted the police violence, the, the causal relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think like, it's really critical that we understand gentrification and that like um, people of all ages, like young people, older people, all generations really understand what's happening when they are said to gentrify a neighborhood mm -hmm. because it's not just like um you know like a white person moving into a historically black area or whatever like it's the disruption of the community mm -hmm. and I think that's what this article really brought to mm -hmm. the fore was mm -hmm. the community um the power that a community has over generations of living mm -hmm. that way and like looking out for each other or certain like uh, modes of conduct that become really ingrained in a, in a community that when you get an influx of um, people who are new to that community, they don't know what they're doing, really. Oftentimes what they're doing could be unsafe. And because we have a racist society, um, people of color are immediately made unsafe when the people who are gentrifying are white. And that's like, you know, the process of gentrification. So like, I think it's important to be able to understand this from a um, structural issue understanding so that like, you know, when it becomes personal, like your daughter or any of us who might be in spaces where these issues are at play, like we know how to operate in an ethical way. Um, obviously those police officers didn't know how to and um, the people who were calling him suspicious like also didn't know how to operate in ethical ways so I think like gentrification is something I mean I I was living in Brooklyn for six years before I moved to Providence it's a similar not as bad as San Francisco but like certainly you see these issues and I think that um I think it's like the community organizing that was what I really took away from this essay and even how it ended with them being in the church and mm -hmm. the community, the lawyer sort of being like, well, this is our community and we will have each other's back. I think mm -hmm. that was one element I really liked about it. it was like, this is such a sad tragedy. This is such a like messed up system we live in, but if we can preserve the communities and support them and understand them, that's the only way forward through gentrification. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just some of my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Engen, did you have further thoughts? It sounded like. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I don't want to dominate the discussion. I apologize if I'm talking too much. You guys just There's only a few of us, so <laughs> just just tell me to shut up. <laughs> I, I I think we're you we're know. at a point where the 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 writing again intersects between how these spaces emerge, right? These structure structural. <laughs> geographies are created and, and the, the violence that's associated with that. But I think, again, the author does a really good job in portraying how those shifts in geographies are also coupled with emotional perspectives, which again leads to Beth's point. And I wanna read a section for you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm being academic, right? Quoting. <laughs> <I'm> using, uh, <laughs> Quoting bottom of page, Bottom of page 16, top of page 17, it's from the letter. Uh, to the mayor, I think by Justin Keller. It oh, says, quote, yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, this is damning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it says, I know people are frustrated about gentrification happening in the city, but the reality is we live in a free market society. The, wealth, the wealthy working people have earned their right to live in the city. They went out, got an education, work hard, and earned it. I shouldn't have to worry about being accosted. I shouldn't have to see the pain, struggle, and despair of homeless people to and from my way to work every day. Mm -hmm. I think this sums up the whole myth of meritocracy mm -hmm. that is so prevalent in our society that prevents us from 
achieving what Kim was emphasizing that we need to understand community. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be more sensitive when we approach each other in terms of how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. I think all of that gets trumped out by this dominant ideological perspective that people often have. And when that's coupled with gentrification, you know, these spaces of exclusion, then it becomes a, a bigger constraint, right? I mean, you on the one hand, you have this structural constraint, this geography changing, you know, there's police surveillance, there's redlining, there's, you know, tax cuts and tax brackets and all those like structural things on one hand. And then on the other hand, you have this perspective or this emotional belief myth that people buy into this ideological structure. And then when they're coupled, it becomes a, a very strong, repressive thing. I'll just do it mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was powerful. So I think we're at that conjunction right now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, some of what you all were saying was helping helps clarify a few thoughts that I had about what makes this piece unique, I think. And I think one of the things is that what Solnit does is, and obviously, there have been people talking about structural racism and structural issues for decades. But I think what Solnit does is, you know, she kind of precedes what I think, what we're, you know, we're, we're currently seeing a resurgence or, or a new public awareness of things like structural, you know, we're seeing this like actual come up in like, in the public consciousness more like the idea of structural or institutional problems mm -hmm. like like um you know trying to get past our ideas of color blindness and like abstract liberalism that like engen saying again again saying is like can give like a token nod to like race issues but still very much lives in this like american meritocracy so i think that's one of the things that makes Solnit's article unique is that, you know, here it is appearing in this, like, you know, popular public, you know, newspaper. I, it, she's, she's looking at structural issues, right, which um, it, it just, I don't think was as much in the public consciousness. I mean, again, academia has been talking about this for decades. You know, people in the, you know, minority communities are well aware of structural issues, but just in honestly, let's be honest, the white public consciousness. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one thing she does um, that is that's the thing that makes her piece unique is she's addressing the structural stuff that, you know, we're talking about. Um, but I think the other thing that struck me, maybe particularly as you were talking, Engin, is um, I think what she's like describing or what she's kind of making us aware of in the piece is this kind of like... Um, so we, you know, we know there's things in the past, like you even mentioned, we know there's historical re legal realities like redlining in the past where uh, minorities, and particularly at the time it was just black, you know, African-Americans were, you know, excluded from or forced into certain areas, uh, particularly urban areas, things like, excluded from like suburban areas, wealthy areas, and forced into poorer areas, which has led to you know, ghetto ghettos, um, you know, poor urban areas of, uh, of, of cities. But like this almost, what she's talking about almost seems to be like a new, like that taking a different form. It's almost like capitalist racism <laughs> of yeah. like, of, and, and I think it's exactly expressed in that quote from that guy. Mm. Um, it, whereas it's more like, capitalist forces of things like you know the rise of technocrats and stuff um because that's what it was in san francisco it's kind of this like you know technocratic takeover right um the tech boom of the west coast you know it, in these like major cities especially in the west coast like for example there's another piece in tales of two americas that uh, is called we share the rain and not much else and it's about seattle Mm -hmm. And the, the writer talks about like the technocratic takeover of Seattle and mm -hmm. how that's like gentrified, you know, Seattle mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. uh, he's looking at it more for the, from the perspective of like, um, like lower middle-class white people where like, 
you know, he remembers growing up as like a, like a longshoreman and he could go to college and like he, when he was in college, he could like work on the docks for like a day and like make his rent for a month. And now, like, and like longshoremen, like in the seventies could have like an extra home on like the Seattle coast. Like they could make a good life. And now it's like, they could barely make a living and, you know, mm-hmm. gentrified Seattle. So it's, um, yeah, but in this case, it's more even, it's like more insidious than that. Uh, again, it's this like, um, and I think Kim was pointing this out, it's when you're one individual in it, it it's your intentions may be innocent or not harmful, but the forces, the larger capitalistic forces are really destructive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that Solnit portrays really well, right? And again, like Engin was saying, these like, on the one hand, you've got this like meritocracy of this, this guy like being like, I've earned the right to do this. Like, like basically I should just be able to come in and do what I want because I have money. And on the other hand, like Kim was saying, like this community that's like really like struggling to survive, right? Um, so it, it just it just made me see like how insidious, yeah, this um, that gentrification can be. Mm-hmm. It's kind of just the, this this other. It's just like this new form, or it can be this new form of like. I don't know if I'd say structural racism or institutional institutional because I mean well I mean actually maybe maybe so because I I think I mean gentrification can only happen if if certain you know zoning laws you know all kinds of things are finagled with so so actually maybe there is a form of institutionalization institutional Um, um, classism certainly I would say yeah, yeah yeah And obviously capitalism can only, you know, work if, if the, the, the wheels of the law are greased in certain ways too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so maybe it's more of a, it is, there's probably that combination of like some institutional, but it's more of these like free market forces in some ways as well that are just like creating this. At least, I don't know, that's, that's at least what I'm observing in the piece um, kind of happening in some ways. I thought there was an interesting um, person who, who she, she focused on a little bit and it was this guy, I think it was um, Fritz, um, who was the one who actually made a phone call and he was kind of unsure. I read the thing mm. a couple of weeks ago, I should have reread it, but I didn't. But I think he's the one who made the 911 call based on something like his friend had said and he wasn't so sure about it, but- yeah. He thought, yeah, well, maybe, maybe um, we should call. And then that kind of led to the death. And, um, but then at the court, he felt, um, he felt upset at the part he played in it. He, he mm. really felt bad that that's what came out of him doing what he sort of thought he should do. And um, I thought that he was really kind of a, um, an interesting person for her to focus on because he was kind of caught in the the stress of the stereotypes that he's surrounded by and um you know not really being part of the community and understanding what was in what was in the community and um probably you know being a, a victim of his own um you know his own stereotypes too I'm sure as we all are yeah yeah so there's certainly there's certainly the individual aspect of everything, what happens in the story too, right? Is in, in that, um, you know, there are the larger trends, you know, that we've been talking about and that Solnit um, focuses on, but there's also, there is the individual kind of racism, stereotyping, right? There's mm-hmm. like the assumptions of like, oh, he's wearing certain colors, so he must be in a gang. Um, I mean, even the fact, even just like the the guy with the dog, right? <laughs> like he's the one that's not like. I mean, it just like oozes like capital P privilege, right? Like where he's just like his dog is the one that's like off the leash harassing Alex to the point where he's like on a bench, like maybe pulling his gun out to tase the dog, 
and like and then, and then the guys like talked about how he's distracted by some female joggers but so that's just some you know throw some misogyny and you know sexism gross sexism in there too but then he's the one that he says he you know he says he calls alex some racist name that he doesn't repeat and it's just like come on like and then and obviously i mean that's what gets alex so upset he's i mean I'd be upset. I mean, I'm I'm not even a minority person. I'd just be upset if like someone like in a public place had their unleashed dog harassing me. Like I would be shaken after that. And so mm-hmm. obviously, like the people that encounter him after, he's still shaken and nervous. He sees another dog. So he's like going for his taser, and and it just kind of accumulates. Mm-hmm. But then all of them keep thinking suspiciously rather than assuming they keep assuming ill intent right so it's mm-hmm. accumu- this accumulation of just like stereotypes and assuming ill intent mm-hmm. um so obviously i mean that is a factor too there's not just the larger structure stuff but mm-hmm. there's like all these people that kept making decisions to stereotype or assume ill intent right mm-hmm. um which is so there's both factors mm-hmm. um yeah kim did you have a further thought um yeah so kind of what you were just saying about like the individuals and I think that was part of the like fascinating quality of the of her journalism was like being able to peer into all of those Mm -hmm. perspectives about like in real time those like five Mm -hmm. minutes or whatever what was happening um I what do you remember when this was written again did you 2016 Mm -hmm. so this was written in 2016, 2016 which was like five years ago, obviously before, um, you know, George Floyd was killed, before a lot of these Black Lives Matter really became mainstream, movements became mainstream, before like, you know, maybe the Karen figure had become like super Mm -hmm. mainstream. Mm -hmm. I wonder if any of those things, like three things I just mentioned, have made, would have made any difference to, to a situation like this. Like, you know, I don't think anyone wants to be a Karen. And I think now, because there's been so much uh, publicity of that type of character, like maybe we check our bias or check our privilege more. Um, and then also like with just the extremely public, like the police being extremely, you know, they're violent and discriminatory ways being so publicly discussed in the media. I guess I'm just kind of wondering like, do you, if you guys think that would have impacted the way that this scenario played out? Because Chris, you're right, like with her, her investigative journalism really showed that it was came down to these like sort of ambivalent choices that a handful mm. of privileged people made. Like mm. they didn't really feel threatened. They were just kind of annoyed or like maybe even like curious or intrigued. Like they didn't really feel threatened. They were just like, I don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe yeah. I'll call the police. I wonder if like now people would be like, hell no, not calling the police. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like have a little bit more of a awareness of where mm-hmm. that where that could potentially lead. Yeah. Yeah. I think One, it goes both ways. Yeah, go ahead again. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the awareness piece is important, right? And I, I thought um even in the story, the way the 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 execution was described made an impact and i think if more people are exposed to the the damage the the violence uh they're more aware of their actions but i think it could go both ways kim i mean i i think nowadays uh some people actually use 911 as a weapon or a threat on on people of color Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying um now that they know that there's a possibility that if they call 911 on a person of color, that person might be getting shot, uh, you know, execution by the police. So I think it goes both ways. There's critical awareness about your actions and what you do and how they manifest themselves on, on bodies and, and individuals. But I think at the same time, there's also, I mean, we just lived through four years of Trump administration. There's also this idea that, um, Blue Lives Matter, and and that what they do is is for the common good, and and they can be detrimental on folks of color who are not fitting certain check boxes. 
in their descriptions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I see it going both ways. And also I think it comes, comes down to the, that community, the fact that community is disrupted because this, this guy, Nieto, was a, um, you know, he was a child of the com community. He grew up, he, he was known. And like, I think of where, where I grew up, um, which was in Pawtucket, but um, it, it was my parish. It was my Catholic parish actually, where you knew every, you knew everybody. It was like a, um, it, it wasn't the whole city. It was this um, like enclave where families knew one another and families knew one another's children and they grew up there and they were known quantities. And I think that's something that's gotten disrupted in this gentrification process that people can't watch their children become adults because when their children become adults, um, they're considered threats um, mm. to certain other people in the society. Yeah. Well, and that just, I mean, that just highlights another factor is just, um, and I mean, this isn't really good or bad or even insidious, but just like, our society has become so much more transitory, right? Um, people move around much more, people, um, I mean, I think of, so I'm, you know, I've, I am, I am, you know, born and raised in Fall River. I still live in the same house that I grew up in. Um, and uh, I mean, there's some people, some of my neighbors that have been there since, uh, you know, I've been a kid, but there's people that, there are also people, I live in, you know, near the city where there's still like a lot of three tenements apartment buildings. And there's some people that just move in and out, in and out. And I just, there's, you know, there's some people I know, but then there's a lot of other people, even in just my neighborhood, that I just don't know, right? And it's just, mm -hmm. um, you think about, um, you know, you try and sort of get to know some people around you, you know, if they're around long enough, you know, be friendly, but, um, I mean, that's just kind of an interesting factor, right? Is like, oh, someone walking down the street at night, are they like walking to their house? And do they actually live right next to me? Or do they like, you know, who, uh, but then, you know, even that, I mean, that doesn't even have to go to the case of like, I assume immediate ill intent, because that's the other thing we were just talking about, right? Because the oh. ill intent would be like, okay, someone's walking down my street and maybe I don't really know is my reaction just like, well, just like let them be and go on their way unless they're acting very strangely or, or something or, or is it, oh, call the police because someone I don't recognize walked down my street, right? Um, so, I mean, but I think we just have to, we, some of it is just, we have to maybe be just more aware of the reality that, yeah, we just, depending where we live, especially in urban settings, there are, just more people that we might not know, right? And so maybe we shouldn't immediately assume like call the police or something because, you know, I don't recognize somebody, you know? Yeah, it's, it's taking the path of least resistance, which ends into a lot of trouble for folks who don't necessarily deserve to be in trouble. Right. You know, from right. my context, you know, good teachers are the teachers that are, not sending kids to the principal for every little thing right um right you know they confront the situation they they try to resolve it and understand what's going on mm -hmm. uh, the, i think we kind of don't have that much of a personal relational approach in our society unfortunately you know we mm -hmm. we call the police on our neighbors um we Instead don't of just trying to talk to them <laughs> right i mean it's it's I, I was just thinking about my cultural context and what i would do if you know thinking about as you were talking i was thinking about the street that i grew up on i knew everybody and if if there was someone who was looking strange and you know suspicious i still wouldn't call the police and if i did call the police in turkey the police would be like what's your problem just go talk to the guy don't call us until he's <laughs> does something wrong right yeah. <laughs> don't waste our time <laughs> hang up on me right yeah. maybe the police should say that you know call 911 and they'll be like don't waste our time <laughs> yeah. yeah um but we have that relational approach in the country right i mean hey. so many instances i can give you of how people just 
you know, take the path of least resistance and just resort to institutional procedures in dealing with one another, even in the workplace, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we, mm-hmm. we don't talk, we just follow policies and procedures, mm-hmm. which is very uh, sometimes scary. Mm. Do you think some of that is just has to do, particularly in America, with like, um, are that the the fact that our news media has created such a culture of fear? Like, like think of our yeah the twenty four news cycle and news media. Like, what do they portray? It's like always the worst stories of just like murders you know violent encounters so i wonder if like that like that has skewed you know it skews our sense of reality so much that it's just made everyone just more suspicious i mean you think of like the whole like what was it i think uh, like growing up in the in the 80s there was the whole 80s and 90s the whole child kidnapping like scare right like everybody was scared of like their kids getting kidnapped and I don't even know but I don't know if like the data actually bear, bore that out that like more kids are getting kidnapped or like I remember growing up it was the whole like you know well be careful trick-or-treating because like you know razors and apples and stuff and like you know the actual reality of like some psychopath you know trying to like hurt your kid by putting something in an apple is just but like the, I don't know these kinds of things just get, get maybe highlighted by the media like like it's just when you watch news is just like bad 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 right so if that's your diet it then makes your perception of the world is like everybody's basically about to murder me or kill me (laughs) so i wonder if that too is just i don't know created this like culture of suspicion in our country where people just automatically are suspicious of everybody so yeah it's like well let the let the professionals handle it, right? Like you're saying, Engen, I'm just gonna like, I don't wanna deal with this because I don't know, maybe they're gonna pull a gun out and shoot me or just stab me or something. So I'm just gonna let the professionals handle it. And then, but then, um, you know, the problem with that is that you get, the professionals are trained to kill basically. So um, it's, mm-hmm. it's all, it's immediate, you know, it's imme- it's like violent first, right? It's kind of the, yeah, I mean, no, no one can yeah. deny in this story that aspect of how impersonal we become. But also, you know, if if the identity was different, would the outcome be different? Or would those people right. walking and seeing this guy, you know, pulling a taser to a dog, if right. Nieto was white, you know, would they call right. 911? So uh-huh. there's clearly definitely a, a selective process that goes on in American psyche in choosing so some people are even more for. suspicious <laughs> there might be right. general suspicion but some people are even yeah. more suspicious than yeah and i mean if, if you are a foreigner if you're black if you're a person of color then you're gonna get the call um mm-hmm. as opposed to a white person mm-hmm. i mean being if you're white you can go uh, you know like storm a police station you can storm the capitol building yeah. they, they, you're <laughs> fine <laughs> Jeez. Right. yeah uh right but good unless luck if maybe you're, a you're like a, unless maybe you're a poor white person who has a mental health issue or something like that. I mean, you might get lumped into that. But even, even then, even then, even yeah. then, I think just by having the privilege of having a white skin, a fairer skin, you are a little bit safer against violence in this country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is which is the bottom line for this story, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I also, yeah, everything that you guys are saying is super interesting. Um, I just want to bring up one other thing that I've been thinking about with this story as we've been chatting or article or whatever situation, um, which is that we can't really ignore the, the role that big tech plays in all this. And like, we know we're living in a time when wealth is really, um, you know, becoming even more, the disparity in wealth is becoming even larger than it already is. And exponentially in a lot of this is because of big tech and, you know, there's so much about Facebook in the news recently. So I think it's become again, even more understood from a cultural and governmental or whatever political scope that this is, um, 
a problem. Like this is like sort of not helping society. It's actually making these divisions worse within our society. And uh, we talked, we started this conversation talking about capitalism and like how money plays such a role in gentrification because people, I mean, that quote that Ingen read was so perfect at expressing that, like, I feel entitled to this community because I can pay for an apartment here. I can mm -hmm. buy a house here. Therefore I can do whatever I want. I don't want to look at homeless people. Like this idea that money um, enables you to have these sort of inherent like rights or privileges in a space. And mm -hmm. I think specifically with talking about the Bay area, we have to fold into that conversation the role of these tech giants, um, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook, all of those, all of those um, Silicon Valley companies that really were the things that gentrified San Francisco. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying like, I, I like have an answer to this, but I do think it's important to always like historically ground where we can, the reasons for the wealth, mm -hmm. um, you know, disparities and like the, the companies who might be at at some degree responsible and like the role, the ethical role that they play to take when they come into a community, whether it's educate their employees or have a more comprehensive nuanced understanding of the communities they're coming into. Mm -hmm. I think that like, I don't think we can get away from talking about mm -hmm. big tech, even though mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. love it if we could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Which, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like maybe finally i mean big tech is being called to account in some ways but i mean it's not even on the issues you're talking about right tim it's more just it's more like just content on the net right it's not even the fact that like you know what they're actually doing to actual communities um i actually saw an, a headline interesting headline the other day it was like is, is big tech the next is big tech the next big tobacco in terms of like, you know, the confrontation, mm -hmm. um, you know, where um, tobacco got to the point where, you know, the government finally was like, we need to, there, this, there was a, finally this social movement. I mean, we're kind of seeing, I think, starting to see that now. I mean, not even in just the last month, right? Stuff has come out about how Facebook like has known about, um, you know, misinformation and division. They've known that their product is doing this and yet they don't care they've done nothing really because it makes money right i mean that's not even getting to the stuff that you're talking about right mm -hmm. which is, is yeah, like and the well, actual it, it on makes the, money on the ground for uh, the yeah. ceos it makes money for the executives who are not the majority of the employees of those companies so right. many of the employees are like even angrier about their the company's conduct than we are because they don't stand by the standards. So yeah, it makes, it does make money, but obviously it's like Mark Zuckerberg is making money, not the, right. you know, right. software engineer or whatever who's mm -hmm. doing their day job. Yeah. 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 There was a company yeah. um, a few years ago um, moving into Oakland and I can't remember who, if, who it was. I mean, I want to say TripAdvisor, but I don't think it was TripAdvisor, but anyway, one of their um, kind of pillars of their move into Oakland was a commitment with the city to work on housing, hmm. um, housing equity, which I thought, I mean, I didn't follow it after that. So I don't know how that ever turned out. But I mean, I think that we need yeah. more of that. Um, I, I really do. I think it comes back down to like, I, if enough people have what they need and if things are fair, yeah. I mean, not to oversimplify, think there's not going to be as much violence. Yeah. That's, I believe that. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Like, does there need to be a move where, um, where like some of these big metro areas create stipulate? You know, because obviously, like, if there's an advantage for major metro areas to have big companies. I mean, obviously, there's a big financial incentive, right? Um, but is there an, is there enough of a cultural push for maybe like the big metro areas to um, create conditions for those incentives for companies of like, yeah, we will give you say like tax advantages or credits for moving in, but here's what you have to give us as a city, right? Like something like like you have to commit to these things 
like like what you're saying, Beth, right? Like mm -hmm. you as a company have to commit maybe X amount of money or effort towards, you know, helping, you know, yeah, helping create affordable housing in the very mm -hmm. areas you're moving into, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise gentrification is gonna happen, right? Values go up and the people who can't mm -hmm. afford it get pushed out, right? They keep mm -hmm. getting pushed further and further into the poor areas. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, I wonder if that's kind of one of the, I don't know, solutions. It's so hard to talk about, you know, solutions mm -hmm. with things big as this, but. Um, yeah, it also, I just, uh, really quickly, I'll just add to that. I just remembered um, a couple of years ago when I was living in Brooklyn, Amazon won a bid or they wanted to put a factory in Long Island City and they chose Long Island City, which is actually in Queens, even it's actually like part of New York City, even though it's called Long Island City, but they wanted to put this factory in, in the city and the community in Queens organized and fought against it and actually won. And so they went, they went to, I think, Arlington, Virginia. They didn't wind up coming to New York City. So I do think there's been some uh, like maybe cultural understanding and community organizing around like, we don't want these tech giants, they're gonna disrupt our communities. So right. yeah, just, right. just remember that. Yeah, no, that's that's true too. I feel like, yeah, there's definitely been more of that pushback against some of these bigger companies. Um, yeah, trying to move into certain areas, right? Um, so there's, there's a little more, yeah, um, social power now that that people can actually like push back because yeah I think what we're I feel like what Solnit is looking at is that's probably more of the like she's probably looking at I mean what she's talking about was probably more of the results of like the early 2000s tech boom right when maybe and and what we're seeing now I think and what you're noticing Kim is probably people realizing like the results of what happened with that right like the early 2000s tech boom led to gentrification, led to these problems we're now seeing. And maybe we're starting to learn some lessons from that of like, oh, this is what happens to the community. So now communities are realizing like, hey, we got to push back against this because like, we thought this was a good idea, you know, 20 years ago, but then it actually destroyed, you know, it sounds like a good idea, right? A big company coming in, like bringing jobs, but then they actually realized it was kind of a devil's bargain <laughs> in a way, um, right? And so now maybe we're finally starting to learn some of those lessons and, and maybe now there's, yeah, where people are now actually being like, actually, no, we don't want to stay away um, because they, we've had enough time to see some long-term effects play out where this has already happened maybe, yeah. Yeah, Ingen. Yeah, I was just going to add, since we're talking about things that need to be reformed, uh, the story also talks about the justice system uh, and how yep. the jury was uh -huh. kind of skewed from the get-go and the judge was uh, threatening some of the witnesses and the witness was kind of feeling threatened and didn't want to uh -huh. testify. Uh -huh. So another thing that perhaps needs to be reformed is our justice system. And, um, you know, if, if that's possible, then I think it'll be harder for these crimes to be committed. Uh, you know, you, you think twice before you pull the trigger, so to speak. But I thought that was also important in the story that what needs to change is also the, the justice system. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately skewed in favor mm -hmm. of... Mm -hmm the so-called systems and institutions that are in place mm -hmm. yeah mm. yeah and i noticed yeah. nicole is, is in the audience but she hasn't raised her hand i don't know if she wants to add <laughs> something i don't want to uh dominate the discussion nicole did you have something to add we just went on and on and on <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you came nicole um i I don't know. I had a lot of different feelings while I was reading this whole entire um, article. Um, I think the police have had very poor training. Um, they're not, they don't practice before they go in to um, the force. 
they they don't um i'm trying to get the right words they don't practice before they really go out they're not doing hand-to-hand -hand combat it's only with a firearm so they're not getting the proper training that they do need and they don't quite learn about everything especially um with everything that's going on now in the country they're going with like the old old ways of you know in the early 1900s and stuff like that that's kind of what they do um i, I don't i don't know um yeah I think it's extremely sad that people are judged by the colors that they wear and their ethnicity and their race. And it's, it's very upsetting and it's tragic. Mm. Um, and what kind of bothered me was Justin Keller. Um, they are. Yeah. <laughs> the gentrification but they do not have the right to push everyone out everyone else out and mm. i think it'd be unfair and i this whole entire article um it, it bothered me it was very sad yeah. and heartbreaking and it yeah. should not have happened and yeah. they they tried to push a lot of different things onto this case that should not have been pushed mm. yeah Oh, those are all great thoughts. And I think, yeah, I mean, that's, I think, and I think that was the point of Solnit's piece is that it should be, it should be upsetting, right, to read this. Um, yeah, I mean, I was even, even just again reading it, I was shocked at like how like cavalier the police were in this. They basically just went in guns blazing, right? They like emptied their clips, reloaded, emptied their clips again. He's on the ground and then one of the cops shows up and puts another five bullets in his it's like what the hell like um it's just like it's just unconscionably irresponsible like the their the way that they entered the situation um yeah it's just it's just stunning um even even having you know again since this article has come out even reading more stories like this like this was just in insane like their response is just like way like over the top uh, i mean it's just it's it's disturbing um yeah and uh i mean obviously i mean hopefully today we're i mean i think we are getting to the point where there's this realization of like police need different training and <laughs> we need to do things like demilitarize the police because the police have been kind of militarized like over weaponized in some ways um so hopefully you know we, we start to see more change even though uh, unfortunately we've seen a lot more of the same right happen in recent years um but, but yeah those are all great thoughts thank you for sharing yeah You're thanks welcome. nicole thank You're you welcome. all right well um uh, Beth and, and Kim, I know, had to leave, and it is about three o'clock. Um, so <laughs> thanks for joining again, Engin. Thanks for showing up, Nicole. And I hope, yeah, I hope you, uh, even just listening, were able to get a lot out of the discussion. Uh, again, if you're watching this later, thanks for, for listening. I hope um, you're able to get a lot out of it and, and maybe try and show up to one of these in the future. So we've got two, uh, two more of these happening in the fall. Um, there's going to be a discussion of Roxanne Gay's piece, How, in November. And then in December, there's going to be a discussion on the piece, The Worthless Servant by Ann Patchett. And then uh, we're going to continue to do these in the spring, continue to do more pieces um, uh, from the rest of the book. So please join us if you can. All right. Take care, Engin. Bye. Nicole. Bye. Thanks. Have a good one. You too.